Okay, so tonight we're going to be doing the last shiur, the last lecture on the series Embracing Torah Judaism. This is lecture number seven. The conversion process as well as the path of return for those who are interested, who may not have had a Jewish education and want to become familiar with the basics. So this is about basics, important ideas and principles, concepts as regards Judaism for those who are really seriously thinking about converting or simply want to have a, more of an idea of what really Judaism is all about. There's a lot of information these days on the internet, there are a lot of books that were printed about religions and some of them may not be accurate. So it's always a good idea to get the information that you need from the right sources. So hopefully I'll provide some of that tonight as well as in the other shiurim, the other classes that we've had. I think one gets a, a good impression of what's involved. Does it really pay for him to uh, embrace it? Does he really think that this is for him? This is a way of life that he wants to pursue? Or perhaps not. Perhaps the seven Noahide laws are sufficient. And really, for the vast majority of people in the world who are not Jewish, the seven Noahide laws are enough, more than enough. And if they keep them properly, they have a share to the world to come as well. They definitely will be contributing a lot to this world. Those who are Jewish, of course, have more of an obligation to find out more about themselves, more about their identity. So I believe that this will help them strengthen that identity and be able to connect with what their forefathers very much believed in and what they were prepared to give their lives for. So I'm just going to repeat what I said in the very, very beginning, that the Jewish people are described by the Torah as an amlechet kohanim v'goy kadosh. At least that is the goal. That we should be a priestly nation, a holy nation. It's important to know what those terms are. A priestly nation or a nation of priests means that we will be teachers. So we have a very important mission in itself. Judaism represents a mission to the world, a light unto the nations, a light unto the world, so that we can guide others as to what God expects of humanity. Goy Kadosh, a holy nation, involves something very, very unique, or as the Torah calls it, an Am Segula, a nation that is different, that is unique, more uplifted in every way than the rest of the nations of the world. In other words, something that is not ordinary is called Kadosh. Something that is ordinary is Hol, secular, whereas something that is holy is higher. There's something different about it, something more important about it. It is also more spiritual, because our mission is spiritual. It involves commandments that emphasize spirituality. And of course, our yehud, our destiny, is a divine destiny. It is directed from above. It is not something that we made up, something that we decided. We actually took it upon ourselves during the time when we, when we received the Torah. And I think that this shiur is very apropos right now, right before the Shavuot holiday. This is the time that the Jewish nation said, now said in Ishma, that we took it upon ourselves. We accept this unconditionally. In other words, we realize the importance of it. We realize that this is the truth, that this is the word of God. We have no questions, no doubts whatsoever about it. <coughs> the word now said in Ishma, however, means a lot more than just we will do and we will listen. What does it mean we will listen? We will do. Isn't that enough? We will do as, as told. But we're taking it upon ourselves, we're committing ourselves for future generations as well, for our children. They cannot say, well, my father and my grandfather thought that this was good, but we don't want it. You, you can't. You don't have a choice. You don't have that option. We committed ourselves and our children and future generations to abide by these laws. And what that means also is that even if we don't understand a particular Mitzvah, we don't. We don't always understand exactly what is behind a commandment. Still, we accept it regardless of whether we understand it or not. We have complete faith that this is the emet, this is the truth, and that this is good for us. And we commit ourselves to do this even during difficult and challenging times. And there were many difficult and challenging times throughout our history when the Jew was tested, his faith was tested, and many, many times, of course, we pass the test with flying colors, and sometimes human beings, after all, are frail. They failed. They were tempted, or for whatever reason, they did not follow the Torah mitzvot. Either way, 
we don't give up on anyone. We realize that sometimes people fall spiritually, but they can always get back up. They can always do Teshuvah, they can always repent. Everyone has a chance to make a U-turn and come back. In the same way, a non-Jew can convert if he wishes it. A Jew can for sure come back. He has that divine spark in him, and he has a lot of history behind him. So he has a lot of support. But the greatest the most important support, of course, is the support from above. Those who are serious about it will receive support. They will be assisted from above. Nothing to fear whatsoever if you made a mistake and you want to come back. Even though we don't always understand the reasons for the mitzvot, some of them are very, very difficult to understand, it's not our job to understand. Many of them are chukim, many of them are laws that are very, very not logical. They are decrees. And we will be talking a little bit about some of them tonight. So, it is not our job to try to figure it all out. We know that this is the truth. However, it is still important for us to learn. The Jew always was an individual who learned. We are the people of the book. We always based our knowledge not only on faith, of course, but also on what we know, what, whatever it is that we have that was transmitted to us in written form or orally. There is the oral Torah as well, even though the oral Torah today is written down. All of that was transmitted to us and they were very careful in that process of transmission to us. And we are relying on those rabbis and those authorities of the past to have transmitted all the details to future generations. So we rely on that and we trust that this is the emit. So even though we don't understand, we still do our best to learn and to follow and to try to understand as much as we can. The human being is capable of understanding certain things. He may not know everything. Obviously a lot of this is unknown to any human or prophet. Still, we have the obligation to become familiar with many of the aspects of Judaism because it applies to us almost on a daily basis. We have to know what to do and what we cannot do. The mitzvot, as I mentioned in the past, are significant not only because of the reward. We will be rewarded for observing mitzvot, but also because of what they do for us. They actually sanctify us. Here we're talking about being in a holy nation. Are we just born holy? No. Judaism is a responsibility. It's not a privilege. So even though you may have been born to a Jewish mother and you're Jewish, it's not really a privilege, unless of course you do something with it. If you assume that responsibility and you teach yourself and you become familiar with it and you practice it and you give it over to your children, then obviously you're doing your job. But don't think that it's for the reward that you're doing. You always remember in the end, these mitzvot will do something to you. You will become a better person, hopefully a more refined individual, you will become holy. In order to achieve that holiness, however, you can't pick and choose. This mitzvah, yes, and this mitzvah, no. When we said na'asev and ishma, that we will do, we will listen, we will follow, we will abide, we meant we will take the whole thing. We will not pick and choose. There is a problem that some people have that their home is Jewish, very much Jewish, but outside they do all kinds of things that are wrong, that are not compatible with Judaism. You can't be a Jew at home and a non-Jew outside your home. As some would like it to be, they want to give a different impression outside. No, Judaism requires of one continuous, continuous and complete devotion at all times. Even when you're a senior, you don't retire from it. From the moment a boy is 13, a girl is 12, they have that responsibility, they have those duties. And they cannot say, I'm not in the mood, I don't feel like it today, or it's too difficult, too challenging. There are exceptions, and we'll talk a little bit about what those exceptions are. There are times when certain mitzvot cannot be fulfilled the way we would like to fulfill them, but those are few. We need to remember that besides those few exceptions, it is a constant duty that is incumbent upon the Jew to follow 
and of course to teach others, if he's capable of teaching others, what their responsibilities are. So, in observing the mitzvot, we realize what they do for us. They sanctify us, they refine us, and of course, we are hoping that uh, when we leave this world, we will be rewarded for observing the mitzvot. That reward, even though it's one of the principles of Judaism, that there is something called reward and punishment, is something that we also have no idea what it's going to be like. You can have two individuals who observe the exact same mitzvah, one will be rewarded a lot more than the other simply because he worked harder. It was much more challenging for him to do so. But regardless of that, we don't know, no one knows, the value or the reward of a particular mitzvah. Some mitzvot might appear to us to be very minor, but they're really, really great in the eyes of heaven. Especially in this generation where it is, it is so much more difficult to do certain things compared to the past. Whoever does so nonetheless is rewarded immensely because they look at him and they say, wow, you know, kolakavod, look, this individual growing up in such a place and not having the best education, still on his own or with some help, is able to accomplish so much. So he's looked at a lot more you know, higher or in higher regard, greater esteem than somebody who observed that same mitzvah years in the past. So everything, of course, depends on the circumstances. The more difficult and more challenging a situation is, the greater the world will be. But still, we don't do it because of the reward. In the end, we realize that this is the commandment of God, and He created the world, He created us, and He knows what's best for us. He chose us as a nation, we committed to this, so we know that it's in the best of our interest and, of course, in the interest of the world that these commandments be followed. So what are those exceptions that I mentioned earlier? There are sometimes exceptions, for example, if someone is in danger. You know, do you have to risk your life to do certain mitzvot? For the most part, you don't have to give your life. If something is not kosher and obviously you're hungry and if you don't eat, you're going to die. Or all, all kinds of other similar situations where one is in imminent danger, it may be possible, depending on the commandment, to uh, not follow that particular commandment at that given time because of the danger. His life is in danger. So there are exceptions. What are examples of those situations that are not exceptions? The three cardinal sins. Idolatry, murder, and certain immoral acts, that it is not permissible under any circumstances to transgress sins in those three areas that we call cardinal sins. Even if your life is in danger, you are commanded to give your life and not to worship the idol and not to kill another individual and not to uh, commit a certain immoral act. And these areas, what they have in common is that they do tremendous spiritual damage to the individual who's going to commit them, even though he's being forced to do so. You might think, I'm being forced. No, even though you're being forced, because they are so damaging, Hashem doesn't want you to even do it unintentionally, even if you're being forced. Plus, it is also very much damaging to the environment, to the world. For whatever reason that we cannot observe with our physical eyes, when something of that nature occurs, it does tremendous spiritual damage to that holiness of the individual, of course. Damage that is very difficult to repair. And therefore, give your life instead. Or, it is very damaging to someone else, to the environment. Killing someone or committing an immoral act against someone. So it's not just you who's involved here, there's someone else too that is going to be affected by this sin. So you can't take the liberty and say, well, I'm being forced to do it. Please forgive me. <laughs> no, you can't do that. Some sins are so damaging that Hashem says, no way in the world. You have to be prepared to give your life. And the Jews were tested many times with these and other transgressions. And many of them, of course, gave their life instead of, God forbid, going against Hashem. We began to say recently that the Jewish home is built on three pillars. 
The three pillars are Shabbat, Kashrut, the dietary laws, and Tarat Mishpacha, family purity. So here we're talking about 613 commandments. We're talking about observing the commandments so that we become a holy nation, that we become elevated and eventually rewarded. True. But we're told that the Jewish home has three pillars. So what exactly do we mean by three? Why just these three pillars? Well, they are significant. They are very, very important pillars. They actually act as pillars. They are the ones that support the home. If you see these three, if these three are intact, then you can rest assured that everything else is more or less okay. They are probably observing the other means, well, the man probably is putting on tefillin, there's probably a mezuzah on that door, on the doors that require. They're probably doing other things that are correct, like observing the holidays, uh, and many of them are praying. These three pillars say a lot about the Jewish home. They are pillars, they are the ones that will support their home, they are the ones that will designate whether this home is a truly Jewish home or not. So, so much depends on these three pillars, and that is why they're called pillars. So, last time we spoke about Shabbat. Shabbat has many, many laws, many, many details, and it requires a lot of time in order for one to really become comfortable and familiar with what is permissible and what's not permissible. And that is why it's important to always have certain books, which we'll talk about towards the end. Books about Halakha, Halakha meaning that which I'm allowed to do, that which I'm not allowed to do, how to conduct myself in the holidays, and so forth. You want to have certain books at home, you can't always call and ask, you, you want to know yourself. So Shabbat is a very, very big area, a very important area, because it represents a sign between us and Hashem. This is the identifying sign that you're Jewish, you keep Shabbat. Keeping Shabbat is not just resting on that day, but doing everything that is necessary to sanctify that day. And if we sanctify it, we become sanctified as well. Shabbat is very, very powerful, and we've already covered it as much as we can. I still encourage you to become as, as informed as possible on the beauty and the importance of Shabbat, because there's so much about Shabbat, many, many stories about how it protected the Jewish people, because we observed it. So here we are observing it, and we're also receiving protection from it. The next area, next two areas that we're going to talk about tonight, however, is Kashrut and Tarat Mishpacha. Kashrut, the dietary laws, and Tarat Mishpacha, family purity. These are areas that are pillars, and they also contain many, many alachot and many details. So again, these are areas where you want to become familiar with, you want to have some books about it, and it's not something that you can always call and ask. There will always be, always be questions to ask. You always want to have a rabbi to turn to in case there's some complication, in case there's some area where you have no clarity what to do. This always happens. And uh, even though you may be able to look up certain things, it's always better, in case you have any doubts, to ask those who specialize in those areas and who might have more clarity as to what is the right thing to do. So these areas, Shabbat, dietary laws, family purity, they say a lot about the Jewish home, and I call them the interior design of the Jewish home. <laughs> they actually design it, they actually shape the interior of the Jewish home. Why am I saying the interior? Because remember what I said before? Yes, some people have an interior and an exterior. They act differently. I'm not excusing them. Again, I, it's wrong. You have to be the same at home as you are outside your home. But here, we're talking about the Jewish home because we're talking not only about yourself, we're talking about your spouse, we're talking about your kids. This is an entire environment in itself. Your home, your castle that you're building, the future of your children. The chinuch, the education of your kids, will begin in its home. So those pillars better be strong pillars. So they actually form or shape the interior of the Jewish home. You may have, of course, an individual who's very good 
inside his home. Everything is tip-top, 100% kosher. And when he travels, only when he travels, not in his hometown, but when he travels to, to the far east or somewhere, he allows himself certain things. He becomes lax in certain areas. He doesn't realize, by the way, how serious his actions are. He may not realize. But obviously there's something missing over here. This individual is not strong enough, perhaps, not educated enough, to realize that you can't play around. You want to give over the message properly, you want to be a good example, you want to find favor in the eyes of God, of course, too. Then you, you have to be real. You can't be a hypocrite. So, when it comes to Shabbat, hopefully, those that learn the halachot, learn the rules, and practice and review those halachot, then hopefully, they will not make too many mistakes. If you don't learn and you don't review, it's very possible that you will make mistakes. So that's Shabbat. The only thing that perhaps that may come up with may be very, very difficult for one on Shabbat is, is let's say the nature of his work is such that he's being asked to work on Shabbat or to do certain things on Shabbat that are prohibited. So I'm not going to get into all the possibilities. There are many situations of all kinds where Jews are being challenged. Just remember, you cannot just easily give up on the Shabbat. You may have to give up your job, but not your Shabbat, not your relationship with Hashem that comes first. And the reason, of course, for, for not giving in is because every mitzvah, but especially Shabbat, and family purity, and dietary laws, these three, will influence, will have a tremendous impact on your life, on every aspect of your life. In other words, if the Jew will keep or not keep Shabbat, the dietary laws, family purity, if he will or will not, these three areas will make a tremendous difference in his life. They have a tremendous impact. Remember, we're talking here about something spiritual, not just something physical, doing something physical. Even though we're doing physical things in the end, it is something spiritual, it is something that we are going to get from it. And we get a lot, we derive a lot of benefit from these three particular areas. Shabbat, for example, if it's done properly, is an incredible, powerful way of educating one's children in choosing the right priorities, in knowing the difference between something which is holy versus something that's unholy, in understanding better what is blessing and what is a lack of blessing. What is a blessing? So we have a clear tradition that whoever does not work on Shabbat in the holidays will never suffer any financial loss because of that. You will not lose out just because you did not work on Shabbat. Shabbat is a blessed day. That blessing extends itself to the rest of the week. So if you're going to keep it right, if you're going to do things properly, you're not going to suffer a negative consequence as a result of that. Here we're talking about a blessing. Jews look forward to Shabbat. I was told by an Iraqi Jew that the entire week they used to work to have money for Shabbat. If on Wednesday they had already made enough money, they closed their shops. Thursday and Friday they were not open. Why? I've already made for my Shabbat. They worked towards the Shabbat. That was so beautiful. You can work, of course, on Thursdays. You can work a little bit on Friday, too. But look at these genuine, genuine Jews who understood the importance, the value of Shabbat. That's all they cared about. I'm going to save. I'm going to work so I can have enough for my beautiful Shabbat. Shabbat is the queen. I want to treat it properly. I want to buy the best foods for it. I want to observe it as best as I can. And uh, we saw this kind of comportment uh, amongst many, many sincere Jews who were simple, but they were sincere. They were not very learned, but they understood Shabbat. No way am I giving up on this Shabbat. To them it was so natural, it was so simple. And unfortunately today a lot of people don't have that uh, sincerity. They don't understand the blessing, the source of blessing is all from Shabbat. So, I think we've covered Shabbat sufficiently. Now we're going to go into a little bit more of the dietary laws. 
The dietary laws also have a lot to do with Kedusha and holiness. The Torah says, be careful with not consuming certain food because they will contaminate you. The nitmetim bam does not only mean you will become unclean. The rabbis learned from that verse that it will actually yetamtem otcha, yetamtem talev, it will contaminate your heart. What does it mean to contaminate? We're not here talking about the contamination that we're familiar with, with all kinds of things that are just uh, not healthy for your physical body. They can contaminate your body. Here we're talking about the contamination of the soul, the neshama. That eating certain foods, ingesting them into your system, it will do something to your neshama, to your heart. And you wonder why? What should it do it? What's wrong with eating something which is not kosher? I mean, it's, it's okay health-wise. A lot of people eat perhaps shrimp, let's say lobster, all those things. And they're healthy. Nothing happens to them. They live a long life. The Torah says it has nothing to do with health. This is a chok. This is a decree. This is what you should eat. This is what you may not eat. It's not good for you. Because it's a chok, it does not tell us the reason for it. We're supposed to believe. Hashem created the world. He created the animals. He created us. He knows what's good for us. But what do they have in common? The Kabbalah explains a little bit. What they all have in common is that they belong. All those things that are prohibited for us, that we may not eat, what they have in common is they belong to the Mahane Hatame, to the Mahane Otuma, to the camp of impurity. There's two camps, holiness and impurity. And somehow, for some reason, there are certain animals that Hashem created in the world that belong to the impure camp. And what happens when you eat them, when you ingest them into your system, they make you, in some ways, to some degree, impure. I mean, you don't just transform to becoming pure, but it affects you in such a way that it will give you a hard time to observe the Torah Mitzvah, to be a holy nation. Remember we said before, this is what Hashem wants us to be, a holy nation. Hashem wants us to observe the Mitzvah, and Hashem says, here you have an example that if you eat this, it will actually hurt you. It will interfere with you. It will give you a hard time. Imagine somebody wakes up one day and he doesn't feel like doing the mitzvah. Where does this come from? What kind of a, an attitude is that? Where does that negative attitude come from? Perhaps he may have been eating non-kosher food and eventually he cooled off. He cooled off. And there are stories that I can share with you of individuals like that that I was completely taken by surprise. Why don't you have that attachment to spirituality like your brother or your friend does. What's missing? What's wrong? Have you done something so terrible? I mean, it's hard to figure out. We're not going to judge anyone, but we do have a clear tradition that you are what you eat. <laughs> it does affect you in more than one way. So here we're talking about the sensitive area called spirituality. It's very sensitive. And if you just do something wrong and tip the balance and give strength to the other side, to the other camp, then you're becoming stronger in that area. Well, that area is totally incompatible with holiness. And it won't enjoy or want to do that which is holy. It won't be attracted anymore to it. What can we do? That's part of the reason. It may not be the only reason, obviously. There may be other reasons. But that, Kabbalistically, explains partially why we can't eat certain things because what we eat will actually affect us on a spiritual level. Now even if you buy kosher food, 100% kosher food, everything is kosher. You still need to learn how to conduct or how to manage a kosher kitchen. Mm -hmm. Even though all the ingredients that you bought, you put in the fridge, you put in the pantry, are 100% kosher, <laughs> that same kitchen where all those kosher products are, can become non-kosher if you do things wrong. Mm -hmm. So we need to talk a little bit about that. It's not so simple. You need to know how to manage and maintain a kosher kitchen. So, yes, there are times, as I said earlier, that there may be an exception to the rule where somebody may have to eat not, something not kosher, like medication that he needs to take. There might be some situations, but besides the exceptions, and we won't get into them right now. 
As a general rule, a Jew must be very careful with what he puts into his mouth. And of course, with what comes out of his mouth too. Yes, this will have a great deal to do with the sanctity or lack of it in his life. So how do we identify what's kosher from that which is not kosher? So let's begin with the Torah's description of kosher versus not kosher mammals whether those mammals are domesticated animals like cows and goats or deer, wild animals. Basically, Torah says the kosher ones, the pure animals, have two identifying marks, two identifying signs. They chew their cut and they have split hooves. That's it. Even though the Talmud does get into additional descriptions of what some of these animals may have, that can help you identify them if they're from the pure camp or not pure, pure camp. Still, if you see these two, then most likely this is a kosher animal. You can consume it. Now what happens if you only see one of them? You only, you only know it chews its gut. Somehow you, you can't see if it has split hooves. Well, we know that all the animals in the world that chew their cut have split hooves except for three. The camel, the shafan, and the arnevet. Shafan and arnevet, according to some, is translated as the hare and the kani, or the rock badger. I'm not gonna get into that exactly right now because it's a little bit difficult to understand how those two, the hare and the kani, how they chew their cut. It doesn't appear to us that they chew their cut, but we are told that at least there is a form of chewing their cud that is seen in those animals as well. Same thing with the camel. But they don't have split hooves, so they're not kosher. So these are the only exceptions, which is interesting that the Torah will tell us something like that because this in itself is significant that we see that the Torah was given to us with Shemaim from heaven. Otherwise, how does Moshe Rabbeinu know this? Was he a zoologist? Did he study all the animals? He's telling us that's it. These are the only three that will have chewing their cud but not split hooves. And then there's one animal, only one in the entire world, that has the split hooves but doesn't chew its cut, and that's the pig. Try looking for another one you won't find. Now there are animals, of course, that resemble these animals, and perhaps belong to the same genus, the same family, but still it's the same animal, more or less. You won't find additional animals that will have one and not have the other. Either they have both, if they have none, or if it's one of these four, it has one. So, so far we know that what identifies a clean animal is that it has these two signs. If you see an animal that you've never seen before, you went to Africa and you caught an animal and you want to know if you can slaughter it, if it's a kosher, if it's a clean animal, and you see those two identifying marks, is that enough? So, it is best, of course, to have a tradition that you are told that this animal traditionally was known as a kosher animal and it used to be slaughtered. People uh, who lived in that area, Jewish, of course, uh, knew that it was kosher. And then, of course, you can go ahead and slaughter it. If you don't have a tradition, it makes it a little bit more complicated because you're relying on your knowledge and then you're understanding that this is in fact 100% a pure animal because it has the two. Are you sure it has the two or not? So that is why we were always careful to make sure that we also had a tradition if a particular animal or bird or fish, whatever, was indeed kosher. But for the most part, in general, it is true that if you have clarity as far as the two signs that identify this animal, you can go ahead and slaughter it. Properly. So we've identified the animal. After we identify, we have to know how to slaughter it. And slaughtering shechita is very critical. You can't just shoot it, you can't strangle it, you can't just kill it. It has to be done in a very particular, specific way. And if you're not taught how to do it, you can make many mistakes. And if you make a mistake in the slaughtering, you've made it in nevela, which is not kosher. You've made it, you've made it into a dead carcass. In other words, that animal, which you cannot consume. The shechita, the slaughtering, 
has to be done properly. So we have identified the kosher animal. The next step is to properly slaughter it. And after you slaughter it, comes the third step of examining it inside, especially the area of the lungs. You want to make sure that there are no holes. Otherwise, if there are certain blemishes, that can render the animal a terefa. It's a clean animal. The shahita was done properly, but it's still taref because it has some blemish, internal blemish, that renders it not kosher. So let's say you've done everything right, no blemishes, what's next? Nikur, you have to remove certain blood vessels, certain fats, and especially if you, if you do the back part, the back part of the animal, if you want to eat that, you have to remove the sciatic nerve. Not everybody, of course, knows how to do that. That's why we don't always end up eating that part of the animal. But you've done everything right. You still have to remove certain prohibited things that uh, will render this food not kosher. So let's say you've done all of that. Now what? There's still blood in the meat. That blood has to be removed. How is the blood removed from inside the meat? You have to immerse it in water for a little while. The meat will soften. It will become soft. After it will be soft enough, you will salt it with a special salt from inside and outside, all around the piece of meat. And it will be in that salt for about half an hour, an hour, or whatever. And in, in such a place where the, all that blood can drip away, because you cannot consume that blood, that internal blood that's coming out. So you have to get that blood out. In the olden days, remember, you may remember your mother, your grandmother, they had special containers in the kitchen in order to salt the chicken and the meat. In the house it was done. Today, the butcher does it, the slaughterhouse does it. You don't get involved in that area. But this is a very important part of preparing the chicken, the meat, for it to be kosher, not the fish. You don't need to do it with fish, but with chicken and meat, you need to do that. And if you didn't do that, you just cook that piece of meat, it's not kosher. Not only is that meat not kosher, the entire pot is not kosher now. And anything you may have cooked together with it. So you have to be very careful. Thank God we don't have to deal with it. Except when we buy liver. Because liver is full of blood, you can't just salt it. It has to be broiled. It has to be broiled in such a way where the blood will drip away. It cannot sit in its own blood, like in a broiler, in the oven. It has to be done in a way, on the mat perhaps, on top of a barbecue, where the blood can drip away. So if you don't have salt for the chicken or the meat, you can actually broil it too. And then you don't need the salt. Just that with liver, you have no choice. That's the only way to do it. So you have to remember, if you buy fresh liver and it has not been broiled in some places, broil it. You have to look at it. You see it's still bloody. You cannot just put it in the pot. You, can, you cannot just salt it and put it in a pot. You cook it then, you're in trouble if you did that. It has to be broiled. This is all part of knowing how to manage a kitchen. The meat is kosher. Of course it is, yeah. But you have to remember to remove all the blood. You have to remember to remove the sciatic nerve. You have to remove, remember to remove certain fats before you salt the meat. Certain fats are prohibited. We cannot eat certain fats. There's different kinds of fats in the meat. And those who specialize in this, of course, in the slaughterhouse, they know what to remove. Some butchers who do it on their own, they know certain fats have to be removed before the, the, before the salting is done. Otherwise, it presents a lot of problems. So after you've done everything right, what's left? You need a good recipe. You need, you need to know how to cook the meat. <laughs> that you got to do, of course, as well. But all of this reminds us of the following. It reminds us of something called hashgaha, supervision. Even when we go to a store and buy everything ready, we still want to make sure that the hashgaha, the supervision, is 100% good. Because you'll be surprised, unfortunately, you have a lot of people who are after money. You know people like that? Yes. <laughs> they're after money and they're willing to mix non-kosher meat because it's cheaper. They're willing to skip steps. <laughs> Unfortunately, it happens. From time to time, we hear stories like that. They're caught. 
And that presents tremendous problems and complications to the community mm -hmm. if they've been buying from this gentleman. So when you buy something, a product from a supermarket, or from the butcher, you want to make sure that the hashgaha, the supervision, is 100% good, reliable supervision on the product or on the meat, whatever it is. But especially in meat and chicken, I mean, you'd be surprised, there are all kinds of stories. So, even though it's true that the, the meat may be from a clean animal, okay, but who's to say that it was slaughtered properly, that it was examined, the way it should be, that all the fat was removed. There's so many things that perhaps were not done. So that is why you need a good hashgaha, a good supervision. Even when you're buying something in the supermarket, just like potato chips, something simple. You know the oil in which it was fried. Perhaps in the same machines they, they did other things as well. It is kosher, the potato chips, but the same machine was used for non-kosher foods. You need a good supervision on those products that you're buying. You're bringing that into your kitchen. You're going to be consuming that. Your kid's going to be eating that. You want to make sure it's 100% kosher. Okay, the next area is birds, fowl. The Torah does not tell us what the size of a kosher bird is. It just lists 24 categories of birds that are unclean. The minority. It lists a minority. The vast majority of birds or fowl are pure clean. There are 24 categories. You may have heard of the ostrich, <laughs> the eagle, pelicans. These are not kosher. Many of those birds that you read, you may not be able to know exactly which ones they are. Obviously, we don't have a clear tradition as to the names of each one of them. The rabbis do tell us, however, that a kosher bird, a real kosher pure bird, is not a dores. It is not a bird of prey. If you ever have any doubts, if that bird is, has any signs of it being a bird of prey, then it's for sure not kosher. And the rabbis list for us some of the signs that a kosher bird will have. It has an extra toe, it has a crop, it has a gizzard that you can peel. There's all kinds of signs in the Talmud. If you really want to dissect the bird and want to figure it out, you still won't be able to eat it all the time because with birds you really need a tradition. Because it's so tricky, because we don't have complete clarity with, with the signs of the bird, it's just by oral tradition, then you want a tradition whether this bird was in fact eaten in the past in a Jewish community. So the regular birds, whether it's a chicken or, or a, um, a quail, depending on the quail, a pigeon, a um, duck, goose, these are, these are fine. Even sparrow, dror. These are clean birds, no problem whatsoever. Turkey, even though some had doubts about it, but it is. It is a kosher bird. So those birds, are, we have a tradition of no problem, but you still want to make sure that it's slaughtered properly, <coughs> that it's salted, of course, that it has no blemishes. Similar halachot, similar rules that apply to meat, apply to chicken. You'll be surprised, but there are even some locusts that belong to the clean or pure camp, just that we don't know exactly which ones are and which ones are not. We just don't eat them. Fish. With fish, the Torah tells us science. It has kaskasim and snapirim. It has scales and it has the fins, right? These are the two sides. If it doesn't have the fins, and it only has scales, then what? The rabbis tell us all fish that have scales have fins, but not all fish that have fins have scales. So you really want to look for the scale. The scales will be the ones that will tell you. Some fish actually, as soon as you take it out of the water, you don't see anymore, you can't detect the scales, but it did have them at one time, like the mackerel. So you do have in the ocean, all kinds of creatures, as I mentioned earlier, lobsters, shrimps, oysters, clams, all those things that they call seafood, it's not kosher. These are the sharatsim of the ocean. These are the crawling creatures 
of the ocean, they are not really fish. Now, when you're buying fish in the supermarket, you want to be careful that you can see the skin or the scales because if it's already fillet, you cannot just rely on the guy telling him, the guy telling you, oh, this is for sure kosher, this is salmon. Don't you see the color of it? You actually have to see the scales, the skin of it, because otherwise you're relying on someone's testimony and you cannot do that in this case. So, yes, it's $2.99 a pound and you're tempted to go and buy it. No, it's a problem. There's other issues with the knife too. He may be using that same knife for octopus and for other things. So you want to rinse the edges where you cut with the knife. So these are certain halachot that you may not know. And that's why it's important to learn them. You, know, you may come across it from time to time. You're stuck in some city and you want to go to the fish market. So you have to know how to do it right. But with fish, it's relatively simple. If you see the scales, it's a kosher fish. The fins, scales, that's all. But everything else that might be there that comes from the ocean is not kosher if it doesn't have those two sides. All right, so we've bought all our kosher food, kosher meat, kosher chicken, kosher fish, and so forth. Now what? In this kosher kitchen, as we said earlier, it's important to know how to manage. And even though the products are kosher, there are certain issues that one has to really learn the halachot to become familiar with them. One of them is the famous basar bechalav. You cannot mix meat and milk. The two are kosher. But it's a prohibition in the Torah. It's also a hokey decree. Why am I going to get into that? You can't mix the two. You can't cook the two. You can't have a cheeseburger. You can't even make it. You can't even put the cheese in the burger. You're not allowed to cook the two. You cannot benefit from it. So you have to be careful with mixing meat and dairy. So a kosher kitchen, therefore, in order to avoid mixtures of this kind, will separate the cutlery and the dishes. We will have separate meat and separate dairy dishes and cutlery. And of course, if you can afford it, separate sinks, separate dishwasher. You may even have some that are parve. Parve are cutlery or dishes that can be used for something which is not dairy or meat, fish, rice. You may want to have certain knives, perhaps, that are not for dairy or not for meat, so that you can use with anything you want. Once you've cut an onion with a meat knife, you don't want to make a cheese omelet with it. You follow me? Because the knife, the sharp edges of the knife, along with the onion, leaves some of that flavor of the meat inside of the onion. And therefore, whether it's a meat onion or a dairy onion, you don't want to put it in the wrong platter. So, these are the chot, again, that one needs to learn to be careful in order to properly maintain a kosher kitchen. So, basar bechalal, dairy and meat, is an area where there's a lot of alachot. There are sometimes situations that are complicated and you need to ask what to do if, by mistake, you use the dairy spoon to mix your cholent, the meat, or you use the meat spoon to mix your coffee with milk. Sometimes if these mistakes happen, you need to ask, what do I do? Can I still have the coffee? Can I still have the chocolate? And what about the spoon itself or the fork? What do I need to do with it? Because it presents a problem. Another area of the dietary loss in the home is tevilat kelim. You buy new dishes, depending on if it's made from glass or from metal, or if it's porcelain. Some require that they should be immersed in a kosher mikveh for kelim, for dishes, for cutlery, for whatever it is that you are taking to the mikveh. It's usually a smaller mikveh, and if it was manufactured by Nanchu and it's made out of certain material and it's directly used with food, it may require tevila to be immersed before you can use it. So even though this appears to be a minor area, it's still a part of a kosher kitchen. It's knowing that you're buying new dishes or pots and pans and cutlery. Some of them, depending on what they're made of, may require tevila immersal in, a, immersal in the kosher mikveh. You have the area of hagalat kelim. You sometimes have to make a vessel kosher again because it's become not kosher. It was used with something not kosher. It was used with dairy and meat, perhaps, 
and it now needs hagala. Hagala means to transform it back to be a kosher vessel, and that involves using hot water. We use Hagalah, for example, for Pesach, for Passover, when we want to use something for Passover. And we've been using it a whole year for something which is Hametz, something which I cannot eat during Pesach for seven or eight days. So that is when Hagalah also is uh, an area that has to be learned. And if we don't know how to do it, we have to ask somebody's help in order to make Hagalah. Unless, of course, you're going to buy special dishes for Pesach or disposable paper plates and avoid this problem, but if you don't do all of that, you need to know what's involved in Hagalah, which from time to time may need to take place in your kitchen. Another area that concerns the dietary laws is Mishur Akum. You have a maid who's not Jewish, and you want her to help you in the kitchen. You have to know how to do that, how to allow her. You have to be careful not to allow her to bring her own food, of course, which is not kosher, but even if she does your cooking, you have to be involved in the process of turning on the fire, putting the fire on top of the fire. That area is called Bishul Akum. You may have relatives who are not very observant, and they may come into your kitchen and do all kinds of things that are not permissible. You have to be aware, you have to be on top of it. So if you have help in the kitchen, especially a maid, not Jewish, then you have to know what exactly she's allowed to do and what not. Then there's the area of bugs. Yes, you buy salad. What's wrong with salad? It's kosher, grows in the ground. Yeah, but it may have bugs. You don't want to eat bugs. Some of those bugs are very, very serious transgressions. More than pork, sometimes. So certain climates, certain regions have more problems than others, depending on the fruit or the vegetable the leafy ones especially, some of them may contain certain bugs and they have to be rinsed properly, they have to be examined sometimes. Sometimes it's very difficult to wash them unless you use perhaps soap. And uh, it's not easy, but you have to know this. This actually is a fact that it does occur from time to time in certain places with certain fruits or vegetables. You can't just eat it. It may contain a bug that you may not easily see. You actually have to like, take a closer look and rinse it properly. Certain fruits and vegetables are more difficult than others. Then you have the blood of eggs. Let's see, you see blood in the egg. Uh -huh. These are also part of the halachot that pertain to the managing of a kosher kitchen. Wine, what's wrong with wine? It's grape juice, right? It's the juice of the grape. Yes, but depending on the manufacturer, Jewish or not Jewish, mm -hmm. you have to be careful with wine where you buy your wine, milk, even though with milk we're a little bit more lenient because we don't really have the milk in this country of pig and camel, which in the olden days in some countries they used to mix them. Uh, unless it was watched, the milking was actually watched by a Jew, you couldn't have it. So today, of course, the, the halakha still applies that preferably, depending on the situation in the country where you are, you would want milk that is halal beside that was watched by a Jew to make sure that it's only cow's milk or goat's milk. It was not mixed with a milk that is not kosher. Okay. But in this country at least, where they're very, very strict about it, about not mixing other milks, and you don't really have those other milks present in a dairy farm, then one can be more lenient. There are opinions that say that you can be more lenient with it. So, but it depends. If you have the regular Chalab Israel, then why don't you just buy the Chalab Israel that was supervised by a Jew? If you do not have it, but in your country you don't have those problems, it may be okay. You need to consult with your rabbi about it. And the same would apply to cheeses. Cheeses, the, sometimes there's a problem with the rennet. Where does the rennet come from? A non kosher animal, perhaps. Or even from a kosher animal, but that was not slaughtered properly. So even though it may not come from rennet, it was not made with rennet, but because the rabbis prohibited it for good reason, because of the possibility that it's not kosher, then any cheese that you buy needs a supervision, that it was done properly according to the halacha, according to the Jewish law. Bread, bread is a staple food, it's something that we very much depend on. 
you can be a little bit more lenient if there's no Jewish bakery in your town, but you still have to check the ingredients. There are ways that one can buy bread from a non-Jewish baker as long as 100% the ingredients are kosher. So you have to check it out. With bread, there are more leniencies, but you still need to look into if there is perhaps a, a Jewish bakery, kosher bread with a good supervision, that is obviously the preferred one. Otherwise, you can have regular bread that may not be a problem, but what if they put lard on the pan that they baked it on? You don't know these things. You want good supervision. It may be okay, but you want good supervision to make sure that it's kosher 100%. So whenever you're buying any item, there may be all kinds of ingredients that you're not familiar with. Glycerin, what's wrong with glycerin? Gelatin, what's, what's gelatin? Most people are not familiar with these ingredients. That is why you buy something even though it appears to be something which is kosher, nothing wrong with it. Yes, but there may be some ingredients. That's what you want, a good supervision. Somebody who's not Jewish invited you to go to a restaurant for lunch. He says, this is no problem because there's no meat. <clears throat> Just salads and fruits. Could there be anything wrong with this? Well, first of all, you're not giving a good example by being there because people might think, oh, if this Jew is there, it must be a kosher place. So you're not giving a good example. Number one. Number two, it may be that it's a salad, but you think they check for bugs? They don't care about bugs. On the contrary, the more bugs, the better for them. What about the oil they use for the dressing? What about the frying pan that they may have used for things that are not kosher? So you don't want to be in such a place. Even if you bring your own bag, your own lunch with you, you don't want to be seen there. You don't want to give a, an example, the wrong example, that this is permissible. So there's a lot of problems with going to a non-kosher establishment, even though the food may appear to be okay. Not necessarily. By rabbinic decree, we don't eat fish together with meat, even though the fish is kosher, the meat is kosher. Even though it's not dairy and meat, it's for health reasons. Rabbis tell us these two cannot be eaten together. So we usually eat something in between the two. You had fish, you rinse your mouth, you have some whiskey or a drink, or eat some bread or challah, whatever it is, and then go on with the meat. With dairy and meat, for example, you have to remember to wait six hours, according to most yeah. traditions. You just have meat, you have to wait six hours till you have your pizza, till you have your dairy, your coffee, your chocolate. You had dairy, as long as your mouth is clean, you can have meat later, unless the dairy that you have was very, very hard cheese that was aged, then you may have to wait a couple of hours. So, even though you're separating them, you have to separate them sometimes by a few hours in meals, yeah? How would that between the fish and the meat? Not too much. Just, okay. just rinse your mouth. Okay. You just don't eat them together. You don't cook them together, obviously. The fish and meat, you just separate them a little bit and rinse your mouth if mm -hmm. possible. Many, many times there may be trouble in the kitchen that somebody by mistake put a sauce or something that was not kosher. Now what? So, the chicken is kosher, the meat is kosher, the entire pot is kosher, it has potatoes and vegetables, what else does it have? But what you poured in there, you didn't pay attention. That soy sauce is not kosher, perhaps. So you have to ask. There will be times, if you want to manage the kitchen problem, that you consult with the rabbi, what do I do now? And he's going to ask you, how much fell in? How much was it? What's the quantity? What exactly was it? In order to be able to figure what to do with the food and the pot. All right, the last area that we will do now is the family purity. Very important area in Judaism that is obviously pertinent to a couple. A couple who recently got married, they love each other, they want to have a wonderful family together. They must realize that their entire life, their entire marriage actually, their entire relationship will depend on the purity of the home. Uh, the Jew was always very careful in this area because Jewish survival depends on the mikveh. They even discovered mikvaot in Matsada, where Jews ran away, escaping from the Romans. In such a place, top of the mountain, they built a mikveh, they cannot continue. Husband and wives cannot live together as, as husband and wife if there was no mikveh. Because during the period of menstruation, 
or after a woman gives birth, either one. That blood renders her a nida. In other words, she cannot be with her husband, with her husband intimately. Not only cannot the two of them be intimate, but they need to separate. There's certain laws of separation between them for a number of days until she's clean, until after she's gone to the mikveh. They cannot be in the same bed. So in many Orthodox homes, you will always find two beds, not one queen or king size bed, because of that time of the month when it's not possible. And this is a very, very significant area. There's no compromise in this area. There's a lot of details, because this is a very strict area. The punishment is very severe, God forbid, if somebody transgresses this area. Jews were always very careful in places like in Russia where it's cold. They would break the ice of the river. They would go big distances if there was no maker close to town. And that is why when you're choosing a place to live, that is number one, pretty much. A synagogue you can have in your living room if you need to. A mikveh? What are you going to put? You cannot use your bathroom. You cannot use your jacuzzi. It has to be a real mikveh that, it, that it's made properly with rainwater. And uh, not everyone knows how to make one. I mean, this has to be constructed properly. So being part of a Jewish community means being close to a mikveh. Unless, of course, you're already in your 60s or 70s and you don't have to worry about it. But... Uh, for most women who are starting out, having children, they need to know this, that you cannot exist as a nation, you cannot continue unless you have a mikveh. So a woman would have to learn the halachot, all the rules that apply to this. The man would have to have the basic knowledge of what he's allowed to do, what he cannot do during that time of 11, 12 days when he's away from his wife. For some people, they think, oh, it's such a difficult area to be careful with and to practice. They don't realize how beautiful it is. This is the glue of a relationship. When the two are apart for a number of days and then they come back together, it's like a honeymoon again. So there's a lot of wisdom to this. The Torah didn't just tell us, that's it, separate. It's for your own good. You'll appreciate yourself a lot more when you realize the importance of this. And of course, this has to do with purity which means that this will affect the children who are born, depending on if the mother went to a mikveh or not. I'll tell you a quick story. There was a girl, a seven-year-old girl during the Holocaust that was in one of those carts being taken to the concentration camp. And uh, they opened up a little window there and tried to throw out the, at least the kids. Maybe they will survive. And the, the girl's turn came to be thrown out. And the mother says, I don't know if I'll ever see you again. Just promise me one thing, that when you're ready to get married, you tell the rabbi and your future husband, mikveh, just that one word. I can't explain it to you right now, but when the time comes, ask to speak to someone who will explain to you. That's just, just one thing that I want you to do for me. And she promised her. They threw her out. She survived the fall, survived the Holocaust and eventually moved to Israel, grew up as a, as a Jewess, of course, in Israel, in one of the kibbutzim that was very, very secular. And uh, when the time came for her to meet her future husband, who was secular, just like her, she was secular, she told her, listen, I have one condition, and she told the story of Mikveh. The two of them didn't know what this is, but they went to the rabbi, and the rabbi explained to them what they need to do, and they did everything right throughout her life. What's interesting about this story is not that only that she followed instructions of her mother, but this man who married her was one day in the hospital. And he was already, I think, in his 60s or more, an elderly gentleman. And in the same hospital room next to him was a religious Jew. And the religious Jew notices that all the people that came to visit this man who was sick were religious, with beards, rabbis. And he asks him, who are these people coming to visit you? They're all religious. Says, my children, my grandchildren, my son-in-laws. <laughs> really? How do you come to them? You're secular completely. And he told him the story. This is what my wife insisted on. I think it's the mikveh. She always went to the mikveh, never missed. And these are the children that the mikveh produced. Because they on their own, even without receiving a real Jewish education, they grow up in a kibbutz. 
On their own, they wanted to go to yeshiva. On their own, they wanted to be observant. Where did this come to them from? From the purity of the mikra, from the mother who insisted and the grandmother who demanded, don't give up on the mikra. We see what souls came down into this world. They were attracted to that which is holy because the mother was holy. Last but not least, I just want to emphasize the importance of modesty. Here we're talking about family purity. What does family purity mean? It's not just the mikveh, it's the purity of the home. The purity of the home means that a married woman has her head covered. It means that there's no foul language coming out of their mouths. The entire environment is pure. No television, especially with all the garbage going on in the TV. Even the internet is filtered. You have to be very careful with modesty. Modesty in the dress code, no tight jeans, and nothing of that nature that is seductive, God forbid, or in any way very, very not Jewish, very, very secular, that draws the attention of people. You have to be very careful. You don't want to have other men looking at you if you're a Jewish woman. You want to make sure that your dress is long enough. You want to make sure that the dress code is modest and that your kids are dressed properly. All of that is called modesty. Modesty in the behavior, modesty in the speech, modesty in how you conduct yourself in the home. All of that is very important and all of that contributes to the holiness of the Jewish home. I just want to list for you the, the books that I think everyone should have. There may be more. You don't necessarily need to have all of them, but the Book of Our Heritage is available in many languages. The Art Scroll Tanakh, Sansino Chumash, The Living Torah, Code of Jewish Law by Rabbi Gansfried, a Metsuda Siddur from Art Scroll, The Shabbos Kitchen by Simcha Bunim Cohen on the Laws of Cooking on Sabbath and the Festivals by Ehud Rosenberg, The Dietary Laws by Dayan Grunfeld, or The New Practical Guide to Kashrut by Saul Vakshal. A Hedge of Roses is a beautiful book, Jewish Insights into Marriage and Married Life by Norman Mann, The Jewish Way in Death and Mourning by Morris Lamb, Maimonides Principles, Fundamentals of Jewish Faith by Arya Kaplan, The Sabbath, A Guide to Understanding the and Observance by Isidore Grunfeld. Websites that I very much would recommend, esh.com, ohr.edu, ou.org, Chabad.org and JewsforJudaism.org. There are many others, quite a few, but you have to be careful. Remember what I said in the very beginning. There is a lot of material out there, a lot of sources. You want to be sure 100% that whatever you're getting, you're getting from the right sources. And the reason why all of this is, of course, important is because in the end, you're building a Jewish home. You're not just being Jewish. You're building a Jewish home and a Jewish future for your children. And if you're going to be very careful in this area, not only will you be assisted from above, but you will also be blessed that the Shekhinah, that the Divine Presence, God willing, will reside in your home. Amen.